Hello, my name is Chris de Berg. I'm sending you this video message from my home in the Wicklow Hills of Ireland. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured that my song Legacy has been chosen to open the United Nations Sustainable Development Plan from Regent Park in Toronto. Toronto is a city I've been to dozens of times and indeed I love Canada having done at least 20 tours from Newfoundland right across to Vancouver. The song Legacy I wrote for the last one in my album The Legend of Robin Hood, describing Robin Hood as a hero from way back. And the video has been created by Iranian uh, filmmaker Sam Chagini. Already it's been honoured in several prestigious ways. It's a fantastic video by a very clever man. The words resonate, I think, with us at these times because we can all be a hero Although just one voice can be lost in time, but a million voices will be heard. We all think that our voice does not make a difference, but in fact it does. We all can add to the torrent of voices that must be out there saying our world needs changing, our world needs looking after and caring for, for future generations. I'm a grandfather to three little ones. It's their world that I'm thinking about, and we must do something about it now. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the song and the video. Just one dream can change a nation just one man can open a door A single voice can be lost in time But a million voices will be heard Just one dream can change a nation Just one man can Open the door A single voice Will be lost in time But a million voices will be heard Just one dream Can wake a nation Just one man can Break down a door A single
Good morning. Good morning. My name is um, Ananta Krishnan, Secretary General of Urban Economy Forum, and um, I will act as the moderator for this important session. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all here to this grand opening of the World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park. A special honor for us is to welcome the Lieutenant Governor, Her Excellency Elizabeth Doudsville, to this important occasion, without whose vision this pavilion would not have been realized as it is today. Let us give a grand applause for her. Thank you very much. Um, may I then request Alex to make a statement about the land wherein we are. Thank you, Krishnan. Hello, everyone. Uh, we acknowledge that we are in the, the land that we are meeting on is a traditional terry of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with Mississaugas of the Credit. We also acknowledge that the traditional territories of many Indigenous communities across the entire world. In 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development's report, titled Our Common Future, highlighted the great loss to humanity posed by the disappearance of Indigenous peoples and their traditional knowledge and experience. The starting point for a just and humane policy for such groups requires empowerment. This requires the recognition and the protection of their traditional rights to the land and other resources that sustain their way of life. Rights they may define in terms that do not fit into standard legal systems. These groups own institutions to regulate rights and obligations are crucial for maintaining the harmony with nature and the environmental awareness characteristic of their traditional way of life. Hence, the recognition of traditional rights must go hand in hand with measures to protect the local institutions that enforce responsibility in resource use. And this recognition must also give local communities a decisive voice in the decisions about resource use in their area. We also support the United Nations Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues that urges governments to make efforts to adopt general strategies that consider the needs and rights of Indigenous peoples and its recommendations to governments to integrate a gender framework that encompass all areas of their work. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all Indigenous peoples of North America and across the world. We thank you for the opportunity to live, learn, and share with mutual respect and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, indeed. May I then invite the representatives of uh, Council Affairs Andrea, Chris John, and David Sherry. Andrea has been working in the executive capacity of the Council of Fire for over 30 years. And David Sherry is an important person when it comes to arts and culture of the indigenous communities. May I then request them to take the floor. Andrea, Chris John. Yo, go. Sugole Suguego, Yo Daguas, Neil Gats, O Kuali, Mewagi de Loda, Onya de Araga, Mewagi Joda. I send my greetings to, to everyone. I, I acknowledge who I am as Onya de Arg, um, uh, I, and, and I say to you that I'm very happy to be here. Yo Daguas, Neil Gats is that that's my family, my clan family is there. Um, I come from uh, the nation that people refer to as uh, Oneida, but it's Onyida Og, and, uh, and our people are part of uh, all of creation. And so, so today I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to do a different version because we don't do land acknowledgements, but what we do is we, we speak to the issue whenever we have our ceremonies, and whenever we give thanks, we give uh, uh, the Thanksgiving address, and we refer to it as um, the Ganoroka Hoksa, 
and it's the thanksgiving. It's the, the words that we say before all things. We, all things are spoken, and when we gather. So I will start with the, the people from Jokwa. said, today we're gathered. We're gathered and see that the cycles of, the, of life continue. We've been given the duty collectively to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together at, as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now we have given our, our minds and say, we say, Danito. Then I go on to our first mother, and, and we say we, we are all thankful to our first mother, the earth, who gives, gives us all, all that we all need. And uh, she supports our feet so we can walk upon her, and it, is, it gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has comes from the beginning of time. So to our mother, we send our greetings of thanks. And so now we are one mind and we say down in hill. Now we go to the waters, the waters, and we, we give thanks to all the waters uh, of the world for, you know, for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. As we all know, it makes up 80% of our bodies. We know that the power of the many forms the waterfalls and the rain, like the beautiful showers that we're having today, and the streams and the rivers and the oceans. And with one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the spirit of the water. And now we are one mind and we say, Dame to. Now we go to the fish and we turn our minds to all the fish in the waters. We're instructed to, who are instructed to cleanse and, and purify the water so we may drink them. They also give the, they're also given the, uh, give of themselves, you know, for, for us to, as food. So we are grateful that we can, we can stand and have pure water. So now we turn our minds together to the fish and send our greetings and, uh, and our thanks. Now we are one mind, we say down and co. Now we talk to the plants. Now we turn towards the vast fields of, uh, of plant life. As, we, as, as far as we can see throughout the earth, the plants grow working with many wonders. They sustain many, many of, uh, of the life forms. With our minds gathered, we give thanks and look forward to seeing the plant life for many generations to come. And so we are, again, we are of one mind and we say, Donato. The food plants. Now with one mind, we turn in honor and give thanks to the food plants we harvest for the, from the gardens. Since we, be, from the beginning of time of creation, the grains, the vegetables, the beans and berries have helped the people arrive, survive and arrive. Uh, many other living things draw strength from them, too, as well. We give our thanks to the plant foods, and we are one mind greetings of thanks, and we now we say, Don and Cho. Now we turn to the plant, the medicine herbs, and we say to them, the herbs of the world, from the beginning of, of uh, from the beginning, they were instructed to take away the sicknesses. They were also waiting and ready to heal us, they're happy that they're, they are still amongst us and those special few who remember how to use them, how to use these plants and, their, and, and, for, their, and for, their, uh, for their healing purposes. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the medicines and to the keepers of the, the medicines. And now we are one mind, and again, I say, Don Eto. The animals, we gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to, the, to all of the animal life in the world. We give, we, give many, we give many things, we have many things to teach us. And as a, as a people, we're honored by them when they give up their lives so we may have our bodies, as their, their bodies as their food for our people. We see, them, we see them near our homes and in the deepest forest. We're glad they are still here and we hope that, uh, that it will always be that this, this way. And now we are of one mind, down and hill. The tree life. Now we turn our thoughts to the trees, the earth, has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with a shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other, and other contributions. Many people of the world let use a tree as its, as its uh, symbol of peace and strength, like the Ongwahoe, the tree of peace. With one mind, we greet and, and, uh, and give thanks to the tree, tree life. Now we are one mind, I say, don't we? Now we turn, to the, we turn to the winged ones or the birds. And we put our minds together as one and give thanks to all the birds who move and fly above, above our heads. The Creator gave us, gave them the beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life in each other. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. 
to all birds, the great, to all birds from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and thanks. Now we are of one mind, so I say down and go. The four winds. We are thankful to the powers we know of as the four winds. We feel their voices as, as they're moving the air in the, to refresh us and purify the air that we, that we breathe. They help us to bring the change of seasons for the four directions they come, they come bringing our messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. And now we are of one mind, as you don't know. The thunderers. Now we turn to the west, where our grandfathers, the thunder beings, live. With lightning and lightning voices, they bring, the, they bring them to the waters that renew life, that renew all of life. We bring our minds together as one to send our greetings and, and thanks to our grandfathers, the, the thunder beings. And now we are of one mind, and I say, Don Echo. The sun. Now we send our greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from the east to the west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all, of all life. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Now we are one mind, I say, Don Echo. And to our Aksa, our grandmother, we put our minds together to give thanks to our eldest grandmother, the moon, who lights, who lights the, the, the time sky, the night sky. She is the teacher of women of, of all world, throughout the world, and she governs the movement of the ocean tides. By her changing of faces, we measure time, and it is the, it is the moon who watches, who watches over the arrival of children here on Earth. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to our Aksa. Grandmother Moon. Now we are one mind, I say it down into the star world. We say give we, we give our thanks to the music clustering beings that we who are who are spread across the sky like jewelry. We use we see them in the night, helping them mom, helping our moon to grandmother to light the, the darkness and bring dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home with our minds gathered together. One, as one, we send our greetings and thanks to the, to the star world. Now we are of one mind, the dawn and hell. The enlightened, the enlightened teachers. We gather our minds to, to greet and give thanks to the enlightened teachers, those who come to help throughout the ages. When we, when we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way that we are instructed to live as people in Jokwa. With one mind, we send our greetings and, uh, and thanks to the you know, to the to these uh, caring teachers, and now we are one mind. I say, Don Echo. Now we come to the Sagwayan Dizzo, who is our creator. And I say, now we turn our thoughts to Sagwayan Dizzo and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts that Creator Creation has given us. You know, everything everything we need in it to have a good life here on this on our Mother Earth. For all the love that is around us, we gather our minds together as one. And send our and send our Benalumpa greetings to to Creator. Now our minds are one, and I say Don Echo. Closing words. So we say we we ask that we have now arrived at the place where we end our words. All of the things we have named it is not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it with every one of you to send and give thanks to their in their own way. Now we are one mind, and I say Don Echo. So I just want to say you don't go for. Uh, for having the opportunity to listen. And, and so, so this is very fitting because I was looking at your, your the purpose of what you are doing. So you talk about a, a, the results of a strategic collaboration and the same process with Sugoya Dizzo and all of creation is bringing that, uh, that collaboration together, bringing us together of one mind. And in this, you, you call it the World Urban Pavilion. And it's important because in Regent Park is the first place where our people had gathered. And so we're really happy to have you gathered here we're happy to have to share this this area and i do all want to acknowledge when we do special remarks and acknowledge we say our acknowledgement to gunjokwa and that's everyone there is no one above each other but we say our acknowledgement to each of you and that you continue to know that you're loved and cared for in this place of creation so yeah you know. one thank you very much David. Yes. May the request uh, David Sherry to take the floor, please. We have the skill of the chair. Yeah. Oh. 
Uh, hi, my name is David Sherry. Uh, just here to speak a little bit about Toronto Council Fire's Spirit Garden project. I don't know if we have our still that we sent of the turtle. Uh, it's being developed for Nathan Phillips Square for 2024. It originally started as a, an Ontario funded response to call to action 82, which is developing a uh, a monument to honor residential school survivors in each capital city in Toronto. We quickly dropped the word monument because we see the space as a living indigenous uh, project space. Uh, we've received funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage and the project is also funded by and it's a part of a very interesting and unique co-management partnership with the City of Toronto. Uh, hopefully opening in 2024, the space will uh, be a tribute to Indigenous culture, uh, arts, and it will also be a space open to all communities within the City of Toronto for performance work, uh, workshops, projects. And actually, if you go to our website, councilfire.ca, you can see a 3D fly-through that's been developed for the space. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, now, for um, all events like this, the starting of an initiative or venture has to be officially marked by cutting the ribbon that we have in front of us. May I request the Lieutenant Governor to come forward along with Reza Purbiziri and um, Raf Tats, Romy Bowers, Mitchell Cohen, Marlene and Ibrahim, all of you can please come near the table. The Thank you very much. The far pavilion is just near us now. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, now we will have brief opening remarks. May I request Reza Purwaziri, Chair of Urban Economy Forum, to say a few words. As we know, Reza Purwaziri is an architect and a researcher. But at the same time, you also need to remember that he is an innovator and a visionary, ceaselessly thinking of new ideas for action to mitigate the sufferings of the world today in an urbanizing context. 
and the dedication to empower community has resulted not only in the establishment of the Urban Economy Forum three years ago at the first meeting in 2019, the idea of pavilion indeed materialized thanks to the Lieutenant Governor's support as well. So it's an honor to introduce to you, colleague, a visionary, a friend, and most importantly, a thinker and a person who thinks about sustainable development and a sustainable future, reducing consumption and production. Uh, Reza Purviziri. So excited. بنی آدم اعضای یکدیگرند که در آفرینش ز یک گوهرند. Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dazwa, Minister Ahmed Hossein, Mayor John Tory, CMAC President and CEO Rami Bauer, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, mayors and city leaders. It's our deep honor to celebrate the launch of the World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park on the occasion of World Creativity and Innovation Day. Four and a half decades ago, UN Habitat was established here in Canada. Habitat won conference in Vancouver, the first ever global conference to acknowledge the growing challenges that stem from rapid urbanization led to the establishment of UN Habitat. Today, with the opening of the World Urban Pavilion, Canada is poised to lead a global dialogue on resilience and sustainable cities. Today, urbanization and sustainability will take center stage thanks to the collaboration between our founding partner, United Nations and Canada through UN Habitat and CMHC, as well as the Daniels Corporation and Urban Economy Forum. Cities are the engines of development and will play a critical role in really realizing the sustainable development goals adopted at the United Nations Conference in 2015. However, to achieve those goals, we will need to implement innovation models to resolve the complex and multi-dimensional challenges and urbanization of urbanization. Although many stakeholders, activities, and scholars are working to address those challenges, there is a need for a global hub to exchange knowledge and innovation between countries, cities, and communities. World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park will be the global knowledge exchange hub. Collaboration is a fundamental ingredient for, cha for change. This was a strong motivation for all of us at the Urban Economy Forum, encouraging me to think about establishing a home that hosts a global conversation on sustainability and support realization of SDGs. Today, through the dedicated efforts of the Pavilion founding partners, we can realize such an ambitious objective the creation of the, a global hub for exchanging knowledge and innovation. Working together under the umbrella of this pavilion will be champion inclusion, equality, and diversity, emphasizing that housing is a human right. Working together, we will raise the voices of indigenous communities, women, young people, innovators, students, urban activists from cities, large and small, creating pilot projects that will bring about change and innovation, and sharing their best, best practices with the global community. All of this is happening right here in Regent Park, and it's my pleasure to thank the residents of, residents of Regent Park for welcoming us as their new neighbor. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Ibrahim. 
welcoming us as their neighbor, neighbor and for supporting and collaborating with us in establishing the pavilion. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Minister, Honorable Minister Ahmed Hossein for his enthusiastic and continued support for the pavilion. We also greatly appreciate our colleagues at UN Habitat for their tremendous efforts and for recognizing the pavilion as a global hub for SDG Cities initiative. Thank you, Raf. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation and President Raumi Bauer. I appreciate you. For their multi-dimensional support to realize the vision for this pavilion. We look forward to working with the CMHC and other pavilion partners to realize Canada's national housing strategy, ensuring all Canadians have access to safe and appropriate housing. Together, we are building a strong foundation from which to share Canadian innovations and best practices. <clears throat> on housing and sustainable urbanization. I would also like to say a special word of appreciation for Daniel's Corporation. Their support has been a step past from the outset when the idea of the pavilion was first conceived. <clears throat> I'm also pleased to announce that Daniel's is not only a founding partner, but also a founding partner contributing $3 million to support the ongoing operation of the pavilion and its programming. The pavilion will now be known as the Wilderbank Pavilion in Regent Park, powered by Daniels. I would especially like to thank Mitchell Cohen for his steadfast and incredible efforts and for the leadership role he has played in establishing the, this pavilion. The inclusive, <laughs> the inclusive and collaborative approach that he and his colleagues at the Daniels Corporation have taken in Regent Park is an example for others to follow and made it is very easy to choose this community as the home for this new pavilion. I extremely appreciate Mitchell. Thank you so much. But still, we need your support <laughs> for the rest of the journey. Yeah, but it's true. We need support of Mitchell. I also appreciate and want to thank members of the steering committee and management committee for their support with advice and for sharing their knowledge and expertise, as well as the entire UEF family. We have a great family in UEF. For working day and night over the past several years to bring the pavilion to life. Many organizations have come together to support the creation of the pavilion. And I want to thank all of them, including Isocarp, as well as our academic partners, Harvard University, a school of cities, a school of design for developing the virtual pavilion, University of Toronto, a school of cities for leading our initial exhibition, and York University for hosting UEF over the past few years. We look forward to continuing to work with all of our post-secondary partners and will continue to expand our collaboration with other colleges and university around the world. We hope to continue and expand this collaboration in the global south and around the world. I would like to thank everyone here today and those of you joining virtually. The pavilion could not have been realized without your efforts and our collective efforts going forward will strengthen the the reach and impact of the pavilion for benefit of people around the world. In closing, I want to use this opportunity to congratulate Prime Minister Trudeau for accepting the role of co-chair 
of the Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group of United Nations. Yeah, it's important. In seven days from now, on 20th of April in New York, the United Nations Member State will assess at a high level meeting the progress made in, in the implementation of the new urban agenda adopted at Habitat 3 in Quito six years ago. It offers countries a roadmap to achieve SDG 11, target to enhance access to housing and sustainable transport system and other indicators of SDG 11. The launch of the Wilderban Pavilion comes at a right time to showcase it's an example of a good practice for a global knowledge hub for the implementation of SDG, SDG 11 and the new urban agenda. I also want to thank, thank Minister Ahmed Hossein for the, his endorsement of Canada as a front runner country for urban SDG. Cities are at the core of all discussions regarding sustainability, and I want to use this opportunity to encourage all Canadian cities, institutions, governments, activities, and scholars to join this transformative dialogue and to participate in Pavilion's activities. Pavilion's is yours, is your space. So please bring your network, your idea, and your expertise to this virtual and in-person discussion, working together towards a sustainable future. Let us all be part of this solution, bringing positive change to our communities, our cities, and our world. This is a great day for making strides toward achieving fundamental change. Join us in this global movement. Join us in realizing the SDGs and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reza, for your um, timely and inspiring remarks. Um, we have the privilege and honor now to have among us the Honorable Minister Ahmad Hussein, Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion, Government of Canada. Honorable Ahmad Hussein was first elected as an MP in 2015. Um, in, 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 uh, he immigrated to Canada in 1993 and settled right here in Regent Park. So his heart has a special place for Regent Park. He understood the issues that existed at an early age and began his career in public service after high school working with the Hamilton Wentworth Social Services Department. He played a key role in securing 500 million revitalization project for Regent Park. He was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal for his leadership efforts in the Regent Park community. So please help me welcome Honorable Minister Hussein, who sees no limits when it comes to empowering communities. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much uh, and good morning to everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that I'm joining all of you from traditional unceded uh, indigenous territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I want to acknowledge the presence of ministers of uh, uh, heads of uh, departments, uh, Mayor, His Worship Mayor John Tory, Mayor of Toronto, um, and many other uh, dignitaries. Thank you for uh, for giving me your time, and thank you for being part of this important gathering. The Region Park uh, World Urban Pavilion is a knowledge exchange hub uh, that really is about sharing best practices, sharing innovation and research in urban development and revitalization from countries around the world. And I, I can't think of a better place uh, to have this discussion than in Regent Park, a place that I know intimately, a place that uh, really gave me my first lessons in the importance of innovation, in the importance of sharing best practices, in the importance of uh, sustainability. 
and the importance of grassroots organizing to get people uh, to have policies that are people-centered and that uh, is driven by data and by evidence. Uh, and you know, I, I can't think of a better home for the pavilion than in Regent Park. And the aim of the pavilion uh, is really a global network to share science and research and to prepare innovative ideas and solutions including um, including solutions to better prepare and make our communities more resilient through global partnerships. Uh, to be more resilient uh, to present and future uh, challenges such as the pandemics in order to achieve the urban and related sustainable development goals. Uh, the government of Canada is a big supporter of cities being uh, supported and, and, and partnered with to make sure that our communities are more resilient to present and future crises. Uh, we value the role and contribution of Canada's cities uh, in being uh, an example of how we can achieve better innovation and uh, progress and uh, on the sustainable development goals that are related to uh, to urban and related sustainable development goals, and doing so uh, through uh, the focus of municipalities on data, on research, on partnerships, and that's why we're here today. Uh, as I said, the Urban Pavilion, choosing Region Park in Toronto as their new home, is really largely to exactly what I saw you know, two decades ago, the community-centric approach to revitalization that Regent Park embodies. And like everyone uh, that has come before, uh, Regent Park and Tron the City of Toronto and Canada as a whole welcomes uh, people to incredible communities that have really shaped uh, the, the experiences of so many newcomers who have become uh, integral to our ability as a country to grow and prosper. Um, we have enabled the transformation of our communities into places of connection and inclusion for generations to come. And the main goals of the pavilion are also our government's main goals. We share our desire to both of us support cities in Canada and globally. Through the mobilization and exchange of knowledge through the mobilization and exchange, really accelerate revitalization of, uh, of sustainable development and to future-proof cities to better recover from present and future crisis. Design and implement innovative pilot initiatives that are replicable and scalable across the world and create alternative ma uh, models for sustainable urbanization and urbanization that leaves no one behind, an urbanization that results in inclusive economic growth. And doing so in collaboration, as we do in Canada, with national and local authorities, international organizations, academia, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and all the other local stakeholders. We want to be able to make sure that we evaluate cities through comprehensive urban assessments to define find priorities and actions that are needed to realize the sustainable development goals and partnerships and collaboration across the world is important to be able to achieve all of these uh, all of these goals we're going to improve civil society uh, participation through new opportunities for public for the public for women for indigenous peoples for youth and for many others uh, to optimize civic engagement at the local level, at the national level, and, and the international level. Establish uh, you know, the UN Habitats SDG cities program as a global hub in Canada by improving uh, investment opportunities with high impact and long-term results. So this is, uh, this is something that we completely support as the government of Canada. It is particularly um, uh, you know, an honor for me as someone who lived in Regent Park, who understood the power of community to come together, to create their own change and to partner with others and to, to be driven by data and research for a, a more sustainable community to see today 
that the pavilion's home uh, isn't the world urban pavilion's home is now in region park in toronto in canada uh, and 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 partnering with uh, friends and and partners across the world thank you very much for giving me your time and i look forward to the rest of the conversation merci beaucoup tout le monde merci beaucoup thank you very much indeed for these important remarks that will carry us forward in our mission of the urban, World Urban Pavilion. Uh, I would like to request now Raf Tutz, uh, who is the director of Global Solutions at UN Habitat. I have known Raf for many years when I was with Habitat. He was leading the capacity building branch. He was also the sum upgrading program and a number of other programs. One of the main uh, activities that he led in Habitat when I was there was bringing to the fore the importance of cities in climate change and climate action. Cities are both, you know, they cause climate change at the same time, they are also solutions for climate change that he made that point already before, long before the Paris, Paris uh, Agreement. So it's important that he now is uh, also actively taking part in, in, the, in, in, the, in the urban pavilion as well as uh, leading us through this process. And uh, is long uh, the list of dedicated activities in sustainable urbanization and housing. I don't want to go through all of that. I would like to request him to come to the stage and say a few words on this occasion. Here you go, Raf. Thank you very much, Krishnan, for those kind uh, words. Very happy to be here. Um, I came all the way from Nairobi yesterday. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, Ms. Doubtswell, very good to see you after a long time. I was just uh, mentioning that I was, I joined UN Habitat in 95 as a young staff member when Ms. Doubtswell was Executive Director of UNEP. So very fond memories of that um, 26 years ago. Uh, Minister Hussein, thank you for your support to this initiative, um, representing the federal government, which is absolutely essential. Mayor Tory, uh, thanks also for your uh, support. Riza Provaziri, uh, very happy to be here with you in this, um, in this forum. Ladies and gentlemen, with only eight years left for the achievement uh, of the commitments that are set by 2030, Agenda for Sustainable Development, and only just under 15 years for the commitments of the new urban agenda, Local action has never been so central to achieve global goals. And it's very important to acknowledge that we are fall, falling behind and that an integrated whole of society approaches will be needed to gather sectors, to gather communities and different spheres of government towards this common objective of inclusive, green, resilient, people-centered, sustainable urban development. Indeed, local and regional governments are increasingly acknowledged as peers in this process, where they play a key role in ensuring that the last mile approach of the SDGs is making sure that no one is left behind. And recognizing the importance of working locally to accelerate uh, the achievement of the SDGs, our executive director, Madame Maimouna Sharif, has identified turbocharging UN Habitat's facilitation role in the localization of the SDGs as a key aspiration of her renewed mandate as executive director. And in keeping with um, the mandate to actively advance SDG localization in support of the decade of action through normative guidance, technical assistance, and strategic partnership, UN Habitat stands ready to support this. At the political level, we are coordinating or engaged in the United Nations Task Force on the Future of Cities, which was launched by the Secretary General uh, to enhance the empowerment of local and regional authorities in the work of the United Nations. Also, the revamped Local 2030 Coalition 
the United Nations Advisory Committee of Local Authorities, and the G20 platform on localization of the SDGs. At the normative level, UN Habitat has developed, together with many UN agencies, the Global Urban Monitoring Framework, which is an effective way of measuring the city's performance and contribution to the SDGs and other global agendas, including the climate agenda, the Paris Agreement. And we have been developing, with numerous other partners, global guidelines for voluntary local reviews to complement the voluntary national reviews that countries are making at the high-level political forum every year in New York. At the operational level, UN Habitat is also supporting cities in implementing these frameworks and to launch the Global SDG Cities Initiative. SDG Cities is aiming to support over 1,000 cities worldwide to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs and it's providing tools and resources to strengthen capacities of local institutions to drive local transformation and to systematically undertake interconnected processes for city monitoring, strategic planning, and capital investment planning. For this, we have support uh, for financing and implementation of high-impact SDG initiatives through the city's investment facility, which channels public and private sources of capital. I am delighted that the World Urban Pavilion has decided to adopt SDG cities as a centerpiece of, of its programmatic work and has also become a global hub for SDG cities. With the partnerships of the World Urban Pavilion and CMHC, and through the in-kind contributions of tech companies, the SDG Cities Initiative has initiated the pilot stage with the cities in Bolivia, Tunisia, Morocco, Ghana, Kuwait, Spain, China, and Malaysia. And by October of this year, we intend to expand to a far greater scale through partnerships with city networks. And as we move to scale, the pavilion as a global knowledge hub will take strategic roles of onboarding cities, supporting the development of tools, and also act as a secretariat of the SDG cities certification process and as a knowledge hub that shares good practices between cities, including those cities in Canada. I'm also looking forward to other initiatives planned by the pavilion focused on Canadian cities that generate and share innovative solutions to some of the most pressing issues in cities, including affordable housing, addressing inequality, and addressing climate change. We look forward to the continued success of the annual Urban Economic Forum as well in this context. In closing, as co-chair, of the International Board of the World Urban Pavilion, I take the opportunity to thank the Minister, Honorable Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion, Ahmed Hussein, who visited the pavilion last week, also the Honorable Mayor of Toronto, John Tory, and the community of Regent Park for their continuous support and to the World Urban, uh, to the World Urban Pavilion. I also would like to thank the pavilion partners, including the Urban Economic Forum, CMHC, and Daniels Corporation for establishing the pavilion and their support so far in getting the SDG cities global initiatives off the ground, as well as the support to advocacy and programmatic work of the pavilion. At this launch, UN Habitat can confidently state that the pavilion has a strategic role in advancing the achievement of SDGs in Canadian cities and in cities worldwide, and in supporting innovative solutions to pertinent issues faced in cities. We are fully behind the success of the pavilion and count on the continued support of all of you here in person or joining online as we aspire through the pavilion to accelerate SDG impact at scale in cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raf, for your kind words. As you know, uh, one of the founding organizations of uh, World Urban Pavilion is UN Habitat. So it's good to 
get the vision from the president of human habitat in the context. It's not very often mayors get re-elected. Yeah? Well, if a mayor gets re-elected, it's a proof of the love and affection people have that for the person. In that context, John Troy, who is the current mayor of Toronto, was re-elected as mayor in 2018. He has been working to build up the city as a global hub for technology and innovation. And he has what, secured millions of, uh, millions of dollars, especially for, uh, uh, for sustainable uh, transit expansion. So the, you know, he has been trying to make Toronto as a sustainable economic engine of Canada and has a strong recovery that creates more jobs and helps residents and business in all parts of the city and take into consideration sustainability at the core of the development. May the request John Troy, his worship mayor of Toronto, to say a few words. Here you are, mayor. Well, thank you very much. And uh, the only reason I'm not there with you this morning is um, because I'm just uh, my first day back at the office having been uh, isolated with COVID. And uh, so it was thought best that uh, I should be working here and uh, not uh, exposing myself or more importantly, all of you to uh, what, what uh, hopefully is something that's gone away, but uh, we, we're working on that. And I want to just say, uh, in the presence of Her Honor, who I'm always delighted to see and who's done so much to bring these issues to the fore over time, her entire career, including as Lieutenant Governor, but also the Minister. Uh, the Minister, uh, Ahmed Hassan, has been such a great partner to Toronto. And, you know, you heard him talk a little bit about his own story, and I think that has made him an even better partner um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve here through the World Pavilion. He's been such a supporter of that, and I thank him for that. It wouldn't be in Toronto, I think, if it wasn't for his uh, help. And, of course, I think it being in Regent Park, um, and I'm, I welcome uh, today some of the representatives of the Regent Park uh, community, and that, that's a broad uh, group that uh, includes Marlene de Genovia, uh, Ibrahim Afra, and it includes, of course, people like Mitch Cohen, who had so much to do with this community, um, you know, taking shape the way that it has in a revitalized form. Um, but, you know, it, it is fitting, I think, that it should be there as we, um, you know, look at this community that has come to life in a revitalized uh, fashion um, and has become a staple in our city. And I think a global example, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say a global example of the kind of good city planning and development, but the kind that can take into account sustainability, can take into account inclusivity, can take into account uh, resilience of all kinds, including social uh, resilience. And we're not all the way there yet by any means, but we, I think, um, have something here that we can work with, and we are indeed modifying it for application in other places across the city. And I hope through the pavilion, we will be able to learn from people who come here virtually or otherwise, and they will be able to learn uh, from us, which is really what we have to do here. And I think it's a lot of it is the mix of people, the mix of types of housing, the supports, the um, the resources of the community that are present now in Regent Park that weren't before. Um, and I think it stands a much better chance of um, you know, reimagining a community like this um, and, and, and thus producing a better outcome for people in terms of their quality of life, their inclusion, um, and um, the, um, the, the contribution that that community can then make uh, to, uh, to a growing city. Uh, you know, we now have here in the site of where you are all today, not far from where I am at City Hall, a vibrant fixed income community uh, that includes every kind of housing you could possibly imagine, but it's right in the heart of the city of Toronto. It's healthy, it's much healthier in many respects uh, than it was before. Um, and I think that this is the kind of thing people are trying to do around the globe. And as I say, people will learn from what we've done here as they are doing. We will in turn learn as people come and look at this and as people take advantage of the pavilion as a place to share ideas. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking all the time for new ideas because, you know, what has, I think, helped us to grow and to prosper has been that we're seen as a city that welcomes innovation, uh, that welcomes people who are innovative, that welcomes creative people. Our, my commitment to the arts is yes, because I believe in artists and in their stories that they tell and how that can bring a very diverse city together and help us to examine our own soul and understand our own stories better. But it's also because um, it's, it's a beacon uh, to creative people from around the world, to people who are even coming to talk about urban issues, that Toronto is a place that gets it, that embraces creativity and innovation, and, and they can see that through how we treat uh, our artists. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those who believes, and I make no apology for saying this at all. In fact, I'm proud to say I, I believe in the existence and mandate of the United Nations. Because if you look at a world that today seems to be absolutely beset by polarization and division, there are a few places left globally where people can come and, and, and hopefully have the intention of talking with each other and talking to each other as opposed to talking at each other or past each other. 
there's just so much going on where people talk past each other and talk at each other. Um, and I think that, you know, the pavilion is going to represent an opportunity in terms of sound, sustainable, um, inclusive uh, urban planning to have just such an exercise under the, uh, uh, the auspices of UN Habitat and the United Nations generally. And I'm proud that that's going to hap happen in Toronto. Um, we continue to have the creation of this kind of community, not just in Regent Park, but elsewhere, because there are other communities that have um, been left behind. They have been left behind, and the people who live in them, more importantly, have been left behind, where we have work to do on kind of replicating and then improving upon uh, the Regent Park example. And I can just tell you that working together with my deputy, Mariana Bailao, this is a top priority, if not the top priority that we have, uh, to make sure that we have the affordable and supportive housing, which is at the very core of giving people the kind of quality of life and the kind of opportunity and the kind of inclusiveness that they would expect, uh, like everybody else. And that includes being included in opportunity. Um, I will just say to you that um, the, the, the best lesson for me has been what can be achieved when we work together. And when I have the kind of partnership I've had with um, Ahmed Hassan and his government, uh, where we have put together some innovative and, and uh, very effective programs to support the most mar marginalized and help them to have the dignity of a home with the supports they need to fully get on their feet and be then included uh, completely, um, then you can see what our pathway is going forward to kind of continue to replicate and expand those programs together uh, and hopefully join other governments in as well. And then add that to ideas that we get from around the world through the uh, work of the pavilion. But we've made major strides forward and I'm looking forward to kind of consolidating those gains and moving forward to have a strong recovery for the city. Because like other communities around the world that are part of this exercise, um, a lot of people have suffered a lot in many different ways uh, as a result of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and so the pavilion is going to help us with that. It's going to help join other people around the world in that task, uh, which is very important because we're long past the point where we have a premium on all the good ideas here in the city of Toronto or Canada or North America, uh, for that matter. And we have a real obligation, I think, as people who are very fortunate, relatively speaking, to share uh, some of our own ideas and experiences, knowing they don't apply in a cookie-cutter manner, but where we can share some of what we've learned uh, with other places from around the world. Um, the, I will just say to you that um, I, I want to say how, how grateful I am that we were chosen, uh, how grateful I am to the Government of Canada for helping us to host this, how proud I am of the fact the City of Toronto is going to host this, and the community of Regent Park in particular, a community that I'm incredibly proud of. Every time I visit, I see something new and something different that's happening there that is an example of how we can put together these complete uh, communities that are inclusive, that are sustainable, that are resilient, and, and that has to be our objective for every square inch of this uh, great city that uh, I, I'm proud to call a home. So I look forward to working together with you. I thank you for putting up with my being here on a screen. Uh, and I'm just sorry I can't be with you, but I will look forward to being there as I was for the groundbreaking at some uh, future occasion when we're sharing some uh, great ideas on how to help cities around the world be the kinds of places, the kinds of exciting, innovative, um, quality places they can be for people to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, John Troy. One important word that he used in his uh, speech was inclusion. Was inclusion is key to harmony, especially in communities. In that context, the region Park community is not only a symbol of inclusion, it also has actually practiced inclusion by accommodating us here at Regent Park. So inclusivity that way, it, you know, goes, goes different directions. So may I then request Marlene de Genova from Regent Park community, who has been a resident here. She is a co-chair of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association and Social Development Planning Committee, and has been working closely since the planning and inception of the, the World Urban Pavilion, constantly attending meetings and providing inputs. May I request Marlene de Genova and uh, Ibrahim, uh, uh, also a steering committee member of the World Urban Pavilion and a president of Regional Park Community, who has been here since uh, 2001, is a co chair of uh, community building working group in Region Park, a founder of grassroots, or grassroots organization. Yeah, it's called what? Vision for Tomorrow? Yes, Vision for Tomorrow providing also a vision virtually of a, of a tour of uh, today's Regent Park as well. And uh, he has been a president of the community steering committee of the World Urban Pavilion since 2020. So both of them will provide uh, inspiring remarks for a way forward. Here you are, 
Marlene and Ibrahim. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marlene DeGeneva, and I'm the re a resident of Regent Park and co-chair of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association and a member of the, the Pavilion Steering Committee. I'm here with my co-presenter, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Afra, uh, and I am a Regent Park resident, and I welcome you to Regent Park. Uh, Marlene, go ahead. Uh, we're here to officially welcome the UN Urban Pavilion to our community and to say how happy we are that you've chosen to bring this place of information sharing and exchange. We see so many opportunities for community members to interact with the various activities that will take place at this pavilion. How very appropriate that you have arrived at this point in our history. Regent Park is an amazing, unique, uh, community with our long, rich history of community activism and a strong sense of pride and belonging. It is one of the most culturally diverse communities in the world. It is home to over 10,000 residents with over 30 ethnic lang languages spoken. Currently, Regent Park is um, undergoing the largest community housing revitalization in North America. Since the 1800s, the residents on this tract of land have struggled with poverty, inequity, stigmatization, and the misguided attempts by various politicians and the like to bring their reforms to, and solutions to solve our perceived problems. But Regent Parkers are pioneers. Although through the years, many redevelopments have taken place without our sanction or consultation. But this time, with meaningful resident engagement and consultation, we are determined to get it right. That's why it's called uh, revitalization, revitalization and not redevelopment, because it's not just about replacing the, the bricks and mortar. This remarkable undertaking is about improving the quality of life for all of our residents. The most significant change that came with revitalization was the change in income mix. Whereas Regent Park had been exclusively Toronto community housing, we are now a fully mixed use, mixed income community with TCHC, market and rental housing, retail, restaurants, grocery stores. That's an enormous change. Although TCHC residents and market residents are not equal in numbers, we are committed to equality and in the community decision-making. Um, all communities cast their votes, 50-50 community housing, 50 and 50% 50 market residents. Realizing that our focus and goal would need to be so now social cohesion and social inclusion. We need to bring our communities together and understand each other. That's vital. A social development plan was created for the neighborhood and agreed to by the city, TCHC, and the Regent Park Neighborhood Association. The SDP was created as the governing body of the community and its goals of social inclusion and cohesion aligned so well with the Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is making city and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. The UN World Pavilion is a unique and invaluable asset on our journey. It affords us the possibility of sharing with other equity-seeking community members around the world regarding what works and what doesn't. One thing that we have learned and we know to be true is that participatory decision-making with community members, the people with lived experience is essential to the success of any revitalization undertaking. And that requires a willingness of those with power to share that power 
with residents who have actual lived experience. Participatory decision-making needs to be a foundational principle for SDGs, embracing all, embraced by all levels of the process. On a very personal note, I am so incredibly proud and honored to be a member of the P Pavilion Steering Committee uh, and an active member of the SDP and the Regent Park Neighborhood Association. And that is because it allows me to work with the most extraordinary people. I've been in Regent Park for slightly under 10 years. I, I have met people who are smart and wise and tenacious who will fight for these fundamental things that we need here. Um, people who love this community so much that they will work tirelessly with commitment and determination for equality and justice. I will also say that we have the most amazing young people uh, in, in that any community could ever possibly want. Their energy and creativity will carry us into the future. Um, and so thank you very much. And now I give it over to my colleague. <laughs> thank you, Marlene and ladies and gentlemen. Like Marlene, I want to share with you my philosophy of what I have learned living in this community. My philosophy starts with three Bs. The first B is belief. Believe change is possible. And this can take a long time for someone to really think that a vision that they have can really make, can happen. And that belief is very important for anybody to start their journey in making their community better. So today I wanna share with you that many communities around the world will learn from each other and will create this sense of optimism that their change and our change for creating a better community can happen by learning and exchanging ideas from each other. The second B I have is begin. You have to start your journey from somewhere. Sometimes you have to start alone. Sometimes you have to start at the grassroots. And sometimes you have to start as an organization. But you have to begin wherever capacity is at, whatever people that want to believe with you, you begin there. And the next B I want to share with you is build. Building takes a lot of effort, and you build with others. Many of the things that you will see today in this neighborhood and as we will learn from many neighborhoods, it takes a lot of communities, a lot of stakeholders to come together locally, government-wise, nonprofit-wise, to build in collaboration in creating the vision of a better community that we all deserve and we all need. So building takes all of us to do it. Today, there are three opportunities for you to learn about this community. The first opportunity is behind me. Uh, this is the Regent Park journey. It's a small highlight of what has happened uh, all of these years. The second opportunity is to, to partake in a virtual tour that will happen today on the side over here. But the last opportunity is my favorite, and it's an opportunity for local residents to guide you through a physical tour. But today it's raining, so we will stay indoors and give you that physical tour with the virtual tour and combine it and to share with you our story of how we as a community together have collaborated and made this home something to call wonderful. Thank you very much. What I wanted to say was that I'm very excited with this opportunity to showcase Regent Park, to share my experiences, and many of the residents today are willing and able to come and share with you how amazing this wonderful neighborhood is, and that is because at the local level, at the city level, and at the nonprofit, and all of these people coming together, there is an African proverb that says it takes a whole village to raise a kid. So I want to say it takes all of us to make this planet better. So thank you and welcome to Region Park. Thank you, Marlene and uh, Ibrahim. Also, we need the whole cities to bring up people as well. Um, the year 2030, has a lot of significance for Canada. Because one is, everybody talks about the SDGs and the goals and everything. Also important for Canada is, by 2030, everyone in Canada will have a home that they can afford. 
that meets their needs. There's a quote from Romy Boas, who is the president and CEO of Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And she has been a catalyst in solving affordability challenges and a leader in building a housing system that is equitable and free of systemic racism. CMHA's uh, Canada Housing Policy, it's, a, it's, a, it's a responsible for implementing the housing policy at the first of its kind. Uh, and, and, the, and the 2030 is the goal that there's a, a matching goal of SDGs and the housing strategy, which is quite interesting that pavilion becomes a vehicle in some way or the other in achieving that. So there is no one better than Romy who can understand the housing needs of Canadians and develop new client-focused product and services because she has also been the financing sector of housing for years. The mayor then request you, Romy, to join us and give us a few words indeed. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Vision, for those very kind words. And also thank you for all the speakers who preceded me. Some very uh, amazing comments today, and it's really an honor to follow you. And uh, as a resident of Toronto, it's uh, really a great honor to be here at Regent Park. Uh, Regent Park has roots in so many areas of the world. It's, uh, as uh, Mayor Tory mentioned, it's a very multicultural neighborhood, and it's so appropriate for this pavilion to be placed here. And I view the pavilion as now a window into the world, and it brings uh, a connection between Toronto, between Canada, and the rest of the world. And the, the reason why the pavilion is so important is this idea of collaboration and the sharing of ideas. Uh, in order to achieve sustainable development goals with respect to uh, urban development, we have to all work together. And uh, the wise elder uh, used that word um, collaboration in the, uh, in, her, in the land acknowledgement and her words of thanks. And, and for me, the World Urban Pavilion is a, is a forum for that collaboration. We need to, uh, uh, as, as a Canadian, the housing challenges that we face are really great and we can't solve them alone. And that applies within Canada, all levels of government, private sector, and the, and the private sector have to work together. But when you look at the world as a global community, we need to collaborate as well. And the pavilion provides that forum for that collaboration. And it's really an honor for CMHC to participate in that collaboration. And through the government of Canada, we've contributed to the building of this pavilion and for the program that's going to continue for uh, five years to come. And uh, it's a really uh, eventful day today. Uh, the pavilion is finished. We had that great uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. But what's really important in the days to come is what actually happens in this forum, the conversations, the exchange of ideas. And that's what I look forward to most. And CMHC is absolutely thrilled to be at the table and we look forward to sharing our ideas, our challenges, our successes. And in turn, we want to learn from others as well. And I look forward to that journey. So thank you very much for all the organizers who are providing us with that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby, for your kind words. As we all know, without CMSC's um, support and encouragement, our pavilion would have never been realized. Thanks once again. And uh, someone who's always been focusing on people and, and, and uh, vitality of communities, not just bricks and mortar, is uh, Mitchell Cohen, and who is the president of, uh, and CEO of uh, the Daniels Corporation. He is a recognized industry leader of course, as I said, elevating the importance of community development. Mr. Cohen has demonstrated an unmatched commitment to city building that puts people at the center, as I mentioned. And of course, it connects and binds together how physical spaces can indeed facilitate or hinder this communication. That's what I think we are witnessing today. A sense of community. So his, his corporation, his corporation, along with him, 
want to sort of make us all realize and think that beyond bricks and mortar, that's where communities live. Here you are. Thanks so much for that introduction. Really appreciate it. Your Honor, Lieutenant Governor, welcome. So great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Minister Hussein, hopefully you're still watching and, and part of this, Mayor Tory, and distinguished guests from here in Toronto and literally around the world. It's great to have all of you join us for this opening. It's truly an honor for all of us at Daniels to be here as one of the founding partners of the World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park. It has also been a tremendous honor and a privilege to be able to be working in this community hand in hand with local residents over the last 16 years, and also in partnership with Toronto Community Housing. And I wanted to say a welcome to Kelly Skeet and Peter Zimmerman from Toronto Community Housing. They have been partners, they have been the originators of this revitalization from day one. But the residents of this community, we're here today. We're here today because of the residents of this community who came together back in the mid 1990s. And they came together not just to complain about their homes, which were actually falling apart, not just to talk about and think about the stigma, the stigmatization of this community which was very, very real for a number of decades. But they actually came together to develop a vision for how this community could be transformed. Now the voices of those residents, their voices resonate right here, right now, today. And they ring true through the principles of revitalization that were embedded in a document that was already referenced, the Social Development Plan. Truly a groundbreaking document that is looked at today around the world as fundamental to this kind of transformation or revitalization. That Social Development Plan continues to be the blueprint that guides the process of revitalization today. Those principles, they were the roadmap that brought UN Habitat, that brought CMHC and Urban Economy Forum to this neighborhood and to this moment. As you've heard, the launch of a global platform that will share best practices in developing healthy, inclusive and resilient cities. All of us at Daniels, we look forward to learning with and learning from city builders from around the world, but not just the politicians, not just planners, not just placemakers, but also we look forward to learning with and from local residents whose daily lives are often deeply impacted by decisions that are too often made by them. Sorry, for them and not by them. That's the challenge making decisions locally. Local voices have, in fact, shaped this transformation. And this pavilion provides an opportunity for all of us to share what we've learned working together over these many years. Now, one of the most important lessons learned is partnership and collaboration. That's been mentioned many times already. But from the outset, the City of Toronto embraced a public-private partnership model. And that is what set the stage for an approach that brought all sectors together under the umbrella of a shared and a very powerful vision. Private sector partners brought enormous resources and expertise to the table. And the nonprofit and charitable sectors expanded beyond traditional service-based models to build both individual capacity and community wealth. Now, for example, United Way Greater Toronto's Social Infrastructure Investment Fund 
is demonstrating a participatory grant-making model hand-in-hand -hand with local residents from this neighborhood. This new pavilion will also showcase local economic development strategies, highlighting, for example, how social procurement can drive economic health for artists, for artisans, for entrepreneurs, for caterers. And on that note, a special shout out to the caterers from the Region Park Catering Collective who are here today and who will have some special treats for us momentarily. Thank you to Suray and the team from the Catering Collective. In order for all of us to create a more sustainable future, we must embrace the wisdom and the worldview of Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers who have lived in harmony with the earth for thousands of years. As part of our journey, we look forward to learning from our neighbors at Council Fire and continuing to learn from other new neighbors that are moving into the community. Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council, representing 18 urban Indigenous organizations, will be moving into this building right down the hall later this year. As we move forward to a more inclusive future, we're also looking forward to sharing affordable rental and affordable ownership models from the platform of this pavilion. Highly replicable, highly scalable, scalable models that have been piloted right here in Regent Park. This pavilion will also showcase a real-time initiative as Access Now and local residents map this neighborhood's accessibility accomplishments and challenges. We need to learn what we did right and what we didn't get right so that we can plan better for the future, so that we can all be part of a global dialogue to ensure that all of our buildings, our homes, our neighborhoods will truly be safe and truly be accessible. Before closing, a special shout out to our fellow founding partners, to Romy, you and your team at CMHC, for immediately understanding the significance of this opportunity, not just for Toronto, but for the country as a whole. We look forward to continuing to work with you and with Debbie and your entire team as we go forward in this pavilion. We also look forward to working with Minister Hussein, but also his colleagues across the whole of government, the whole of government, in order to firmly establish Canada as front runner of urban SDGs. And to everyone at UN Habitat and Urban Economy Forum for walking this community with us back on that beautiful evening in October 2019, walking this community and recognizing the potential of this community as your platform, as your platform to project inclusion, accessibility, affordability, and resilience around the world. Today is a landmark day in the history of Toronto, a day that our late councillor Pam McConnell would have truly loved. Pam McConnell, who envisioned and nurtured this revitalization, would have loved this moment, a day to celebrate the remarkable spirit of Regent Park residents and of this community. We deeply appreciate the energy, the enthusiasm, and the commitment that all of you, local residents, have made and are making to this process. This is a long and slow and intentional process and your commitment is incredible. So on behalf of all founding members of this pavilion, thank you for embracing us, for embracing the changes and the challenges of a revitalization and for welcoming all of us into your neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell, for these words on behalf of all the 
founding members, and uh, we continue this uh, collaboration and partnership, as you mentioned, including the role and importance of private sector. So that I think it's, it's a, we need to realize that, uh, that uh, city development sustainability cannot be achieved without one important section of society that generates you know, economic value and, and productivity in a way that the private sector does. I think it's important that we are reminded of that, and that's where I think the pavilion needs to be, be uh, sharing its focus as well. Thanks once again. And um, as, as we know, we talk about practice, we talk about uh, experience, etc. There's a need for theory and practice to come together. That, that is facilitated often by academic community, universities. So we have today Professor Diane Davis, Charles Diane Norton Professor from the Regional Planning and Urbanism of Harvard University with us. Um, really on a virtual mode. And he, uh, she moved to the, the, the GSD in 2011. She served as the head of the International Development Group in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, where she also had a term as Associate Dean of School of Architecture and Planning. She's, a, she's trained as a sociologist, and that means the, there's a kind of a multicultural, multidisciplinary cross approach to urbanization as well. And she is an expert in comparative urban governance and uh, urban, urban sort of poor uh, influence in, in shaping the urban infrastructure, especially in Latin America. And we are glad to have you as a partner uh, for the World Urban Pavilion, engaging your students and your faculty in this process we are eagerly waiting to hear your words, Diane Davis. Here you are. Thank you, Secret Secretary General Krishnan. I'm going to be quick, I think, because we are running late on the agenda, and I have a lot. I have several slides that I will show in a few minutes. But I want to first of all say I'm honored to be in this group of very esteemed uh, leaders in their fields who've given presentations before landing at me. Uh, I'm here to share with you a little bit of the initial fruits of the academic collaboration that we've embarked upon with the Urban Economy Forum. And again, I'm, we're so honored to have been, have been chosen along with some other universities to help you brainstorm about ways in which to make a global virtual pavilion to build on all the advances that are obviously happening there in the city of Toronto, in Regent Park, with the local community, we wanted to bring a global perspective into the possibilities of, of kind of knowledge generation and collaboration uh, that could be uh, advanced through the, the Urban Economy Forum and the Virtual Pavilion in Regents Park. Um, ultimately, as I was just saying, that we uh, I offered a course this semester I uh, had 25 excellent students from all around the world who were enrolled in a class that we taught at Harvard to help start brainstorming about what would happen, what should, what should happen with the virtual pavilion to engage global communities, both North and South, around the issue of advancing the SDG 11. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail about, about the course that we offered, although I'm really happy to share the syllabus if people would like to see that syllabus, but really looking more at, at best practices, both successes and failures with respect to advancing SDG 11. What the students ended up finding out was thinking about the, the kind of dilemma of implementation around the globe. And we've heard so many impassioned comments today about the importance of sustainability of communities uh, and cities with a focus on equity and other challenges. But the question becomes, how does this really happen? So our students spent the entire semester digging around on the web and contacting actors and institutions to find a little out a little bit more about what they were doing. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly through some of the ideas that were generated by the students. But the point I want to make here, and this is why I believe that UAF and and Reza and Alex and their team have 
trusted us to join with them is that at the GSD, we have students that are trained in a variety of different disciplines. They have amazing visualization and communication skills, as well as a deep knowledge of landscape architecture, architecture, urban design, and urban planning, all elements that are important to advance SDG 11 goals. So one team, for example, looked around the world at different types of empowerment. And I might note that some of the very inspiring words of Marlene and Ibrahim on the kind of empowerment and the community action, we've looked at those types of activities around the world, as well as government-led actions, uh, NGO actions. We had another team that looked, for example, at questions about how do you finance SDG goals and what might be the kind of decision change that you would, uh, somebody would need to follow to get a project funded. Uh, we also tried to understand the complexity of the scale or governance contents in which local actors are trying to advance sustainability at the scale of the community. Sometimes you need actors at scales all the way up to the nation and the globe for city, state, nation, and globe. And lastly, we tried to think a little bit more about what would be the best way to take this knowledge, present this knowledge to a global community and, and appeal to people both on the basis of what they know, but what they might want to learn new from other places. I'm in a way inspired by what Mitchell Cohn was saying about learning about what's worked and what's not worked. Uh, and how to build on that. That's kind of our objective with the Global Virtual Pavilion, although obviously what works in one context might not work in another context, depending on governance, finances, et cetera. So we are struggling to think about developing a virtual uh, global pavilion that allows us to share not just the stuff that we already know, the usual ways that sustainability is advanced, but thinking uh, about unusual, we call it unusual, not just the usual sp suspects or not just the usual um, advances of, of projects, but like un unusual or, or innovative is maybe a better way to understand how to advance sustainability. I'm just going to end with these last couple uh, slides because I'm just trying to give you a taste of what we're committed to and we're going to be working on developing this global hub over the next several months so we can have a launch of the hub itself when we will be relying on communities both in Canada and Toronto as well as around the world to help us launch this hub for knowledge and learning and it will have several thematic portals which would include looking at the challenges or maybe even, you know, kind of the successes or the barriers as well as the enablers to getting things done. The types of innovations that are happening around the world, processes of implementation, which ones are working and which ones are not, how do all of those address equity? And of course, addressing issues of conflict because we not, should not be surprised that there may be pushback against sustainability efforts. And we all want to create consensus about advancing or moving forward rather than being stalled in conflict. The last thing I would say, and it's very obvious in this, in this launch today that this hub, even though we're working on the global virtual pavilion would very much be intended to be a place to convene events, workshops, roundtables to really start a conversation hopefully between residents of Regent Park and other parts of the world so there can be transnational or cross-context learning through the hub. Um, this is, I just have a couple slides on the kind of how deeply we've got into the analytics of understanding innovations, challenges, barriers to implementation, how to execute positive strategies, thinking about conflict, what types of conflict are common, but I'm 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 going to stop there. I don't want to do. Uh, I I really don't want to uh, uh, take too much time. I just wanted to give you a sense of what we're trying to do. And thank you so much to Alex and Reza and the team and to the Secretary General for inviting me to be here today. Thank you very much, Diane Davis. Thank you very much indeed. I know that uh, occasions like this are also occasions for networking which means there is a possibility that some kind of unnecessary decibels are created by conversations in the corridors and corners, which may distract 
people from listening to the speeches here. So may I request then, esteemed participants, in case they need to discuss network, they may use the corridors as, as usually, please. Huh? And, and we would um, uh, like, to, like to move on to the next item on the agenda. I don't know if people are listening at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, um, of course, it's good to network where it is possible in the corridors. Yes. Thanks. So then we have one of the thing, one of the founding partners of Habit of of, 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 of the World Urban Pavilion is Habitat, as we mentioned. So today we will be witnessing the launching of the SDG Cities Initiative of UN Habitat here at the Pavilion by Diffed Aubrey, is a senior advisor at the UN Human Settlements Program, which is in short called UN Habitat. He currently coordinates UN Habitat sub-program on shared prosperity of cities and regions. And he's also passionate about the possibility of cities to improve quality of life in, and the residents to achieve the SDGs, as well as He's also focusing on how do we get private sector motivated and engaged in sustainable housing and sustainable urbanization. Different you are, please. Give a big hand for him. Thank, thank you very much. And um, my name is David, as um, Krishna was mentioning. And this is actually my first visit to Canada, and I'm really privileged to be here in uh, Regent Park, Toronto, on my first visit to Canada, and hopefully there'll be a few others. Um, I want to talk briefly about uh, SDG cities. We've heard about Regent Park, and we are trying to see how we can span from working in communities to working globally. And what we're experiencing here is a little piece of what the SDGs is about. And um, if I can put my slides up, please. Uh, thanks. And, and what we're trying to do with SDG cities is it's a collaborative action to unleash the potential of cities to accelerate sustainable development and improve quality of life for all. If we go to, to the next slide. What we see globally, next slide, please. Um, Okay, uh, and we'll go to the next one. I, I, we heard a bit about the um, Regent Park caterers, so I, I'm quite keen to move through this quite quickly and enjoy what's coming next. Let's go to the next slide then, I'll skip a few. So SDGs, we've been hearing about the Sustainable Development Goals, and this is a universal action. It's not uh, for one country, it's not for the, the poor countries or the rich countries is for every country in the world. It's a universal action to end poverty, to protect our planet, and ensure that people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. So there's only eight years left. And there are 17 goals, and these goals are premised on the basis of leaving no one behind. That means that there's no race left behind. That means that there's no age group left behind. It means that there's no gender left behind. It's a pledge for all. And uh, it's, we've heard about the implementation. It's an all of society. Even though 193 countries committed to this, it can only be achieved if everybody works together. And as Marlene was telling us earlier, you know, if the UN can't impose this uh, agenda. Even the global, the, uh, our national governments and our presidents and prime ministers, they can't oppose this agenda. It has to happen from communities in order for it to work. And I, I think that was what you were telling us early, uh, earlier, Marlene. And I think here, we've had the experience of seeing how communities can generate a vision uh, for their future and how that vision can be supported by local governments getting behind it and supported by national institutions also getting behind it, and then the private sector working to make it happen. And this is exactly what all of society is about. It's about communities knowing what they need, being guided by uh, guidance around national policies about climate and inclusion, etc., um, civil society mobilizing this, 
and the private sector coming in and saying, you know what, we can make this work. And this is a little, this is why I'm so excited that the World Urban Pavilion is here in Regent's Park, because this is a little piece of what SDGs is about. It's a little piece of what all of society action is. And, um, and, and this is no, there's no better place for the World Urban Pavilion than right here. Let's go on uh, quickly. So when we think about cities, we see that 55% of the world's population live in cities. The world is urbanizing very, very quickly. And, um, and, and cities also have an impact in the areas around them. So if we can get SDGs working in cities, then we can get SDGs working globally. So cities are, are so central. If we go to the next stage, uh, next slide. Um, but we're not there yet, and it could go either way. On one hand, cities accommodate 1% of the world's population, and they gen eight, generate 80% of the world's economy, and accommodate 55% of the world's population. Okay, and by bringing the factors of production, by bringing people, their ideas, their assets together in a, in a concentrated place, this is how they generate economies. But we also notice that in cities, even though you might get cities generating GDP, generating economies, they're also generating inequality. And we see that when, when countries urbanize quite rapidly, we see an increase in inequality, okay? And also cities are generating 70% of the world's climate gases and also 70% of the world's waste. So the way that we manage cities is key to being able to know whether, on one hand, if cities are well managed, if they're well governed, if they're well planned, they can be real driving forces for achieving the SDGs. On the other hand, they could be a disaster. So we need to make sure that in our program of SDG cities, it's, it's about working at scale and making sure that cities are real engines of sustainable development as we're experiencing here in Regent's Park. Next slide. So we have a kind of a blueprint, the new urban agenda, which, which was um, negotiated in 2016 across all the world's countries. They, they kind of identified what are the key things needed by cities to make them generate SDGs. And one of them is good policies, good, good uh, defining policies. There needs to be a governance system that's inclusive, that makes sure that people are not left behind, that in, in, engages people to participate in decision making. There needs to be good plans, and we see that dense and compact cities which are well connected uh, and with plenty of public space can drive all the issues needed, the economies, it can drive social inclusion, it can drive um, uh, environmental sustainability, so good plans are needed. And then those plans, if they just sit as plans, they need to be implemented. They're implemented by infrastructure. So, and the infrastructure needs to be implemented in a way that also leaves no one behind. And then infrastructure cannot be generated without money, so there needs to be good revenue systems to make it work. So these are the kind of the ingredients of making cities successful. If we go to the next slide. So basically, the theory is this. If cities know their baseline, if they know, if they got good data on how they're doing at the moment, if they can work, if, if the people of the cities can work together to identify their priorities for, for advancing the SDGs and come up with a clear vision and a clear plan. If cities could also have institutions that work effectively in terms of planning, in terms of governance, revenue and service delivery, and if then from the, from the strategic plan you identify the high impact uh, achievements and you have people like Mitchell Cohen to make them happen, then, then we can have the last mile of impact. So it's basically having data, knowing your status, knowing your situation, identifying priorities for 2030, engaging communities in the private sector to make them happen and making sure the institutions are strong and they're able to deliver. So these, these are the combination of what we're trying to achieve. If we go next, please. So basically, yeah, uh, so in a nutshell, data to planning, to project development, to project financing, to impact, okay? And building those institutional capacities at the same time. Now, with time is short. We, so we came up with the idea, let's work across a thousand cities 
and improve the lives of a billion people. Now, um, things haven't changed so much in Habitat since your day, and this is way beyond what we can really achieve in UN Habitat. But what we can do in UN Habitat, with the Urban Economy uh, Forum, with the World Urban Pavilion, with yourselves, is to mobilize a movement towards this change. And this is what we're looking for. It's not a project of UN Habitat, but it's a global movement that we're trying to achieve here. Next slide. So it's a, it's a movement that, that um, brings together these actors, brings together the private sector, brings together local and national governments and civil society, and uh, across this uh, value chain of data to, to planning, to strengthen institutions, to investment, and to impact. And what's needed, even though we know that the private sector and national governments and globally the UN and local governments are all driving towards this achievement, there needs to be a systematized way to do it. Otherwise, we're all running in different directions. So what we're offering here then is a systematized way. We, we've actually developed digital tools so that cities all over the world can have a way of collecting data. They can have a way of understanding and analyzing their institutions. They, there's a systematic way we're building on driving investment, bringing uh, investment into programs, as we'll discuss. Next slide. So what we're offering with SDG Cities is a systematic way of, of doing things and bringing these partners together. We've tried to simplify data. The SDGs has 200, 243 indicators. That's a lot for many cities. So we tried to like, identify what are the most important ones. And so uh, for the last year, we've been working with the UN system to identify a global urban monitoring framework that looks at key objectives of safe, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, and key domains of social, economy, environment, culture, and governance. And those are the sort of the pillars of this, of this monitoring framework. And through that, we've identified 72 of the most important indicators for cities derived from the SDGs and the climate agendas. Next slide. Um, let, let's, let's jump because we're all getting hungry. Let's keep going. Next slide. S -s -s Next slide. Um, so, so basically what we want then is to have these uh, 72 indicators, they're arranged around 20 domains, but to measure, so the city can measure where they are now. They can have a profile across areas of culture, economy, society, environment, and governance to see where they are now. Next slide. And then we need to understand data, not just from the point of view of the whole city, but we need to understand the data from the position of communities within the city, because cities are not homogenous. Where I live in Nairobi, I live in a fancy part of Nairobi, but it's not all like that. There are some slums which are a nightmare to live in. So we need to understand cities from, from the spatial way, from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, so that we can identify where are the pockets that we really need to focus on. Next slide. When you have this data then, you can start the action planning. There needs to be a visioning process. We need to have communities, stakeholders, women, older people, youth involved in that visioning. It's great to be able to also share what the city is doing through voluntary local review and then to use that as a basis for a strategic plan for the city. Next slide. And, we'll, and, we can, and then through that, then the city can have their ambition for 2030. They can see where they want to be on these dimensions of economy, so society, environment, culture, and their governance structure to make sure it's inclusive. And then, next slide. Then they, and the next slide again. When they compare where they want to be with where they are now, they then can identify where do they need to invest their, their uh, attention. And in this particular example, the city really needs to work strongly on the environmental dimensions and cultural inclusivity. Next. And then from that, we have to identify what are the projects needed uh, to drive it forward. So some of these might be uh, software, like some strategies or some policies or some regulations on air quality, for instance, but also the investments, public space, affordable housing, etc. So the data guides what are the priorities, and what investments are needed. Next. And then from that, then you, 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 you develop an, an action plan, 
and then you get the city to really support the action plan. Next. If mayors want to be re-elected, by the way, the best way of mayors being re-elected is to take on the, the needs of the city and to come up with an action plan that everybody agrees in and deliver it. If they go for re-election the next time, they'll be elected because they're delivering on what the people have asked for. Next, next slide. Um, then we, the, the track on effective local institutions, what we're, we're looking at areas of planning, governance, revenue, and basic services. And we've created digital tools now so that you can, cities can self-assess how they're doing in these areas. Let's go to, we'll jump a few slides. Next. And so we have the governance tool, which asks some key questions about how inclusive is your governance system? Next, and how accountable is it? Keep going on the slides. Um, next slide. Uh, a planning tool, which looks at how is effective is your planning system? Next slide. Uh, a mobility tool that looks at the uh, how do you get around your city and the, uh, trying to shift towards non-motorized transport, trying to shift towards uh, reducing pollution, trying to make cities more effective to move around in. The next slide. Uh, and then the revenue system looks at all the tax bases. Next slide again, sorry. Looks, looks at the revenue of the system, looks at the property taxation, looks at all the different things that you can do to generate revenue and sees, are you reaching your optimal level? And if not, what are the things that we can do to fix the revenue system so you, have, you can sustain good services to everyone? Next one. And then uh, we have a tool on, on waste and looks at the whole cycle of waste management from collection to disposal to recycling. Next. Uh, keep going, next one. Next one again, sorry. And then, the, and then the last track then is the, is the investment track. So we're seeing that globally, um, there are so many needs in cities. There's so many brilliant projects that communities can be uh, developing and, and local governments can be developing. There's also lots of money out there. The, the investors now are talking about this thing, ESG, environment, social governance. And they want to put money into good impact. But the thing is, there's like a valley of death in between. You have good projects and you've got money, but there's a valley of death. Think that money is not getting to the good projects because often the projects are not prepared in a way that can be financed. So what we're also doing then is helping cities to prepare projects that are financeable and matchmaking the good projects with sources of investment. Um, let's just jump a few slides. Let's keep going. Uh, and yeah, to, to do this, we've, we've worked through an ecosystem. So a habitat is not the funder, but we have different parties along the way, some which are specializing in the project preparation, helping the design of the projects and the financial design, and others which are putting the first loss investment, the first bit of investment in uh, to broker in other investors to make it happen. Next slide, please. And then we want to recognize the achievement of cities. So there's a certification uh, process. You, you've probably heard of um, uh, World Heritage Sites. These are recognized because cities are making, or countries are making real effort to preserve the history. This is, gonna be, this is SDG Cities certification. This certifies and recognizes the efforts of cities and the, the people living in there and their leadership to achieve the SDGs. Next slide. We are making sure that human rights, gender, and social inclusion are included everywhere. And by having systematized tools and processes, we can show that these issues are mainstreamed throughout so that no one is left behind. Next slide. Uh, the delivery model then is to systematize and get to a thousand cities. We've developed the whole toolkit online so the cities can have access to to tools, diagnostic tools, etc. Uh, we want to work with communities of, of uh, we want to generate multi-city national projects so that we maybe get 30 to 50 cities in Canada, uh, in Ghana, 30 cities, etc. And a national support hub so that these cities can be supported as they go through these tools. 
Uh, and then lastly, next slide. And then where have we got so far on this? So with the great support of CMHC over the last two years, we've been mobilizing this. So we've built the data tool now. We've built the capacity development tools. They're, they're designed. We've put together the city investment facility. And we've brought in two tech companies who are using their CSR to actually build this digital tool. So I just wanted to put a thanks to CMHC. This is what we've been doing with your contribution over the last two years, is to get this system ready to go. And then uh, we've identified pilot countries in Tunisia, Ghana, Morocco, Bolivia, Turkey, Ecuador, Malaysia, Ch China, and Spain. And we're now moving towards the scale-up. The Urban Pavilion will have a key role in that. We're working with city networks, with the UN Habitat country offices, and um, thematic windows to move, uh, to move to scale. And then one of the thematic windows is about women businesses, uh, women CEOs supporting women-led uh, cities. So in other words, women-led businesses supporting cities that have women mayors to benefit from the SDG Cities program but also to empower the women within those cities to become leaders of, and entrepreneurs uh, and, and to just gen generate this sort of cycle of women empowerment. So there are different thematic windows. We have another thematic window on faith communities, how we can bring uh, uh, faith communities on the ground to be supported by uh, high net worth individuals uh, from faith communities. So, there are different windows now for scaling up, but I just want to recognize the support of CMHC to help us to get this off the ground. Next, next slide, I think this is the last one. Um, uh, and so what we see then as the role of the pavilion here is uh, a, a knowledge hub, collecting the data from participating cities, uh, overseeing the onboarding process, so, so the bringing cities into it, advertising bringing cities into it, um, looking at the tools, as we work with more and more cities, we'll have to modify the tools to local contexts. So, continually improving the tools that we have, disseminating knowledge and best practices as we've been talking about, quality to control, making sure that the certification has a consistent quality, and then engaging in the certification process. And it's very timely that just over two weeks ago, the, the Prime Minister of uh, Canada uh, took on the role on behalf of the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations to co-lead the uh, Sustainable Development Goals Advocates Group. I think this could be a really good thing to, to, to provide the Prime Minister with uh, evidence that Canada is working globally. Already we have the pavilion. Already we've mobilized what's the ingredients of the SDG Cities program. We're ready to move to scale. And I think as your Prime Minister works in this Global Advocates Group, he can be talking about the success of the World Urban Pavilion in driving this global agenda. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, the Lieutenant Governor has to um, leave now for uh, due to other pressing engagements we would like to give her a round of applause and uh, thank you for being here um, i know that uh, it has been a relatively uh, long morning towards the afternoon now and uh, of course all of us have been standing to the occasion, as they say, <laughs> literally speaking. And um, so in that context, the morning, yeah, 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 last speaker is uh, Associate Professor Matti Semeati, who will be talking about the exhibition briefly before we break in for some real food after having a lot of food for thought. Matti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. What a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'll be very brief, because uh, I know I'm the last person standing between you and lunch. Um, I wanted to just encourage you to take a look at the exhibition around the back of the room. Uh, the exhibition picks up on the themes of the pavilion, 
It speaks about the idea of creative mixed use buildings. Uh, I want to shout out our team at the Infrastructure Institute and the School of Cities from the University of Toronto uh, who worked tirelessly to put on the exhibition. Creative mixed use buildings are at the cutting edge of what's possible in city building. Um, this exhibition is a love letter to Toronto. It's a, it picks up on a model of city building where you blend for a variety of public, private, and nonprofit uses in the same building in seamless ways that is deeply unusual. It's more than bricks and mortar. It's really about community building and collaboration and how you go from development to communities. And it's, it's really an honor to be having this conversation here in Regent Park, which has many of these creative mixed use buildings, including the one we're in today. So uh, we have examples from the past, like Crombie Park Apartments uh, with schools um, uh, and housing up above. We have examples from the present, like the Red Door Shelter with a condo and a homeless shelter built into it. We have examples of the future, uh, like the Indigenous Hub in the West Onlands. So I would encourage you, uh, as you're eating uh, uh, and networking, just to take a look around the back of the room uh, and just look at some of the examples of what's possible, because it's being done here. Uh, this is piloting what we can do uh, when we work together and we work collaboratively. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing the first exhibition of uh, the World Urban Pavilion. And now we'll take a brief break to get our systems recharged with some uh, nutritious food inside there. So you, can, you may help yourself I, for about 10 minutes. Then we'll come back for a performance and um, other rest of the program, yeah? Thank you once again, everybody. Thanks again. We have had a very meaningful and information-filled information -filled, action-oriented opening session of this pavilion, World Urban Pavilion, on uh, to, uh, today, which is called the um, International Day of Creativity and Innovation. This day was uh, promoted by UN to raise awareness around the importance of creativity and innovation in problem solving with respect to advancing the UN Sustainable Goals. That's what we did, we did today. A, a small step maybe, but a small step indeed have, you know, larger consequences for great journeys. So the World Urban Pavilion's opening was uh, indeed to mark uh, today's um, importance. And the, and the speakers, of course, uh, you know, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, the pavilion, not only as a global knowledge exchange hub, was also a hub for learning, exchanging ideas, mobilizing resources towards the sustainable development goals. So you have talked about knowledge sharing between cities and towns, who can engage with each other, while you know the specific projects are being designed yet. Two of the projects were, were presented to us. One was the SDG Cities Program, uh, which is the UN Habitat's flagship program and they were on exhibitions. So it also mentioned that social inclusion and mobility and the pavilion should indeed improve the possibility of increasing equity and inclusiveness in communities. We talked about environmental challenges, we talked about governance, and highlighted on different challenges and opportunities inherent in present ambitious plans from Canada to the rest of the world to explore the important role of innovation in SDGs. So of course, all, our, all the speakers acknowledge the pavilion as a unique contribution to not only realize the SDGs, but also the NUA, all the short forms the UN operates with, you see. NUA stands for New Urban Agenda. I don't know what, you know, you know what it is. It was, it was a it document was adopted in Quito about six years ago, uh, to, to use as a vehicle for the implementation of SDGs. They highlighted the importance of data collection, knowledge, technologies, essential for the achievement, not only of SDGs, and also for the 
universality of cities and towns. And uh, we heard about the role that the CMXC plays in, in, uh, in creating the goal of housing for all into a reality and working with communities. So uh, I think we had, uh, what shall I say, a very uh, productive, informative and inspiring session of speakers. We emphasize the need for one thing, partnership, collaboration, exchange of ideas. It's not about competition, but about partnership, where the role of partnership in private sectors engagement has been you know, emphasized and we need to have more private sector partners engaged in that respect. And I also thank all the founding, founding partners, uh, you know, CMHC, uh, the uh, you know uh, UN Habitat, Urban Economy Forum, Daniel's Foundation, and the local communities. So uh, we will conclude the session unless anyone has any specific remarks to make before I end and leave the floor for a cultural performance. There is a possibility for one or two individual remarks to be made by way of closing. Anyone has to say? The floor is, it's a chance now, because um, uh, the, the, the session is soon to end. Is anyone? Yes, or? No, okay. Uh, so which means that more or less people are, uh, people have received enough food for thought, a bit of real food as well. So we may then request now the, um, performer from what is called as spoken word performance by Tisania Francis Smith, also known as T. T means many creative, she wears many creative hats, including but not limited to spoken word artist, performer, facilitator, storyteller, creative director, and an aspiring film director. So T uses the art of words and poetry to explore her emotions and understand the world around her. So it's, so it's important that it's not about dry calculations and statistics, how creativity indeed can enhance innovation. Here you are. The floor is yours. Give it give it a Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I've never used something like this podium. It's like super official. Um, well, hello. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I know this has been a long day. Um, I have three poems for you, and it's basically my story of Transitioning from, I grew up in Mississauga, um, born and raised in Mississauga in um, a not so great neighborhood. And then I came out and I moved down to Toronto and it was like Empire State of Mind, Alicia Keys style type of vibe. So this is, these poems are gonna be telling the story of that. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Um, this first one uh, doesn't have a title. I'm not really good at titling my things. So I'm just gonna go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so. The strength she maintains can't be defined by a scale or a bar of weights, Olympic style squats with someone there, just a spot, but rather by a screaming alarm clock. At the crack of dawn with so little sleep, the Z skipped class religiously. Her bounce back game is bigger and stronger than the world's biggest beach ball. Something that she's humble about, but everyone around her knows this without doubt, although it's something she works to prove that she can do what men can do, because as soon as humans had toes and trees had branches, women reign to stand still, no chance is given to gain power in a room where men were built into the window pane and floor tiles, they were built into the buildings that were excluded from. So from jump, she knew she had to jump just a bit higher just to reach their level, so she's overbooked and underpaid just for the opportunity to get somewhere someday. Thank you, short and sweet. Short and sweet for the first one at least. The second one, more about women empowerment. It's like the second step in the journey. Me finding a place of being comfortable with who I am, being in the rooms that I'm in and understanding that like, although I might look around the room and I might not see myself in it, I still belong there nevertheless, so. <coughs> 
She wants to empower us. She wants to be the one that helps lift us off the ground, helps us learn how to use our identities and become the loudest sound in a room that demands for silence. She wants to be the walking figurine, the one that young mixed girls look at and say, that's who we want to be. She wants to be who they want to please. Her use of alliterations and similes, she strives to be a category that the housewife stereotype despises. She wants them to despise her because she's independent and a female. She can do things they always told her she couldn't. She can get dirty in the field and still cook up a good meal. She can multitask and write fast and get the grades and have a loud laugh. They hate that when we make noise. They want us to just sit on the shelves like toys and not move unless told to, to be content with our circumstance and never give us a chance to do what we want. She wants to show other females that we have the power to do what we want. But if she's being honest, she doesn't feel like she can because it starts with her internally and lately she hasn't felt independent enough to touch a mic and advocate for independence. It's tough. She feels like she forgot how to write, how to express, how to feel, and it stressed her out because it's the only way she's known how to heal. So if she's lost that, then she's got nothing. She can't pretend to be a figure, to look for as inspiration when she's losing sight, causing her own complications in the talent room before being called. She wants to be the one that young females want to call when they need motivation, inspiration, foundation. It's much easier to uplift them. But she needs to learn how to treat herself like a friend to empower her own mind before taking on the responsibility of another because she is independent and powerful. Sometimes she can't get under the weather, but she can still get dirty in the field and cook up a good meal. Empowerment is universal. Something she must remember. Just because it's a bad day doesn't mean that she's a pretender. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So this last one, I actually wrote last night. Um, and I wrote specifically for this event. Um, like I said, Empire State of Mind, Alicia Keys, if you understand that reference. Um, I always wanted to live in Toronto. Um, I always knew that like, if I wanted to make it or like accomplish stuff, that like, this is where it is, like, this is where it happens. So that's what this poem is about. It's more of a story in like, a story hidden inside of a poem. Uh, so that's why it's in my trusty notebook here. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> okay. When on her first Addo vacation, her tour guide mentioned that it's later than we think, and in her mind creating tension, realizing the reality that when we say we have so much time, that's our optimistic approach to our unknown lifeline. When he mentioned that time is taken away as we blink and reiterated the concept that it's later than we think, her brain did backflips trying to, trying to accept this instead of sink into an unknown abyss of what to do next. So she sat down and reflected on her most recent steps and as a newly free person tiptoeing into adulthood, the reality of never knowing what she's doing overpowers the accomplishments that are constantly brewing, workouts and backflips like jaws dedicated to chewing, she's still learning to pat her own back. Minimize stress, igniting heart attacks, slowing down, taking in sounds, unwinding at the end of a night on the town, the town she's now in. Something she's never believed in. Her capability to pull her dreams out of imagination, taking the steps to paint this creation, since as a kid, that's something that's lacked, is consistent patience, you see. As a kid, she's always dreamed. Similar to Alicia Keys, she's seen skyscrapers, lifesavers built into opportunity that stem from the garden of the busy, bright city. Her goal was to leave the town she knew, one she could walk through with her eyes closed and heels coming first. Although scary, the city contained the shield to her hurt. This was her perk, her sunshine, her light at the end of the tunnel as she daydreamed of marrying her footsteps to the cement of Toronto city streets, knowing the community built here. And what's crazy is that it was always referenced to as there, but what's now her here, creating pathways once foggy, developing now clear. She knew the people surrounding, the minds always pounding, creating a foundation, knowledge always mounding into what she would soon know as home. As she drove across that freeway, that universal route, she looked up through her windows and knew she belonged here without doubt. To be able to say she's made it here, while some hand holding, napkin soaking, and tears of stress minimized by tears of joy, she's able to self-reflect and not neglect her capability within. So although her tour guide instilled an unsteady stride of a walk down memory lane, she's able to step back and eliminate her own frowns as she realizes where she is compared to where she hoped to be, understanding that she's exactly where the kid in her wished to be. 
Striving to be the opposite of here today, gone tomorrow, as an adult, her main focus is to make the kid in her proud. Provide her with a sense of relief if she ever came to town. To teach her the streets of the city that the adult me lives in now. And I know I switch perspective, but being humble runs in my veins. I have a hard time saying, yeah, I did this my own way. This was all me, something I've always strived to be. To say that I now belong here is not something I take lightly. There's richness in this city that often goes overlooked. There are moments I need to take in on the days I'm overbooked. The potential these skyscrapers have shielded in is something I'm so proud to say that I'm consistently surrounded with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. That's all I got for you. Uh, thank you for being so attentive and listening. I do know it was a long, long morning, long afternoon. I am Spoken by T. You can find me on social media and all that fun stuff. Spoken by T, exactly how it sounds. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, indeed, for those uh, creative and invigorating words. Um, as we say, we, the formal part of the launch is coming to an end, but at the same time, now, we would like to present to you one of the projects being planned and envisioned under the pavilion. And it is one of the creative ideas uh, of architecture by Aki Kids on kids' awareness. Many of the speakers this morning spoke about different age groups being engaged, included in sustainable urbanization, how inclusion is important, where the role of children in neighborhoods and housing, how important it is. So a program has been designed called Archie Kids, and with colleagues from uh, the, the, uh, the Archie Kid, especially I would like to invite Leila Sadri to uh, be here with us and Mati Semayak, and, and, and also we have um, Professor Echeveri has been producing a book in this regard on future architects of sustainability, a glance into our key kids profile. Would you like to say a few words, um, Echeveri? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, what a day, eh? What an amazing day. You having fun? Well, um, my job's just to um, <clears throat> very briefly point out something that um, I, I need to ask my uh, colleagues to come from. So you may want to come. <clears throat> this is my PowerPoint presentation to you. Since 2007, since 2007, we've been missing baselines on what's going on in this planet. Uh, the World Watch Institute ceased to produce this in 2012. They had a, a good run from 1974 till 2012 or so. We're hoping the Urban Pavilion can help now create baselines so we know where we're at and where we got to go. Because we don't have time, you need to learn how to manage your time, ladies and gentlemen. All right? And now you're going to hear from people that have a path for young people to become empowered on how to solve the sustainability crisis using knowledge from architecture, design, and we're gonna hear from my colleagues, uh, Human, Leila, and Pantea. So let's give them a round of applause so they feel comfortable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. So I know it has been a, quite a long day, so I'm gonna try to be as quick as possible. Um, just before I start, to sort this out. Okay, brilliant. So uh, we are good. Um, so thank you for having us. It's it's an honor to be here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Krishna. Yeah, thank you <laughs> for your nice words. Um, so I'm 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 going to just talk about. Uh, what we have been doing um, on Archie Kids in collaboration with 
the World Urban Pavilion, uh, aiming kids, uh, and try to work on the program of kids awareness. Um, this is based on uh, some experience that we had before. So I'm gonna share that experience, also gonna give you a quick report of what we have been doing and uh, a glance into what are the plans for the future, particularly for Region Park in regard to uh, World Urban uh, Kids Awareness Program. So um, to start with, about two months ago, we had a round table, a virtual one. We invited people uh, who are active in the field of kids and we had a very productive uh, and constructive uh, session then. Um, so today I'm, I'm, I'm going to go uh, focus on um, the topic of the book, uh, Future Architects of Sustainability, and how we are uh, trying to enable kids to keep dreaming, uh, enable kids uh, to believe in themselves, to become believers, um, and also doers. So in the last uh, almost six years, uh, we, uh, or actually about uh, six years ago, we started uh, this educational platform called ArchiKid, which is basically a platform that uses architecture and built environment uh, as a catalyst to communicate with kids and bring awareness towards their surrounding. So the whole start story started about six years ago in a small room in an office in Tehran, where Panta, I can see her, yes, there she is started uh, this program uh, uh, and then through the six years uh, now we are here with six hubs operating globally in six uh, countries uh, we are offering our courses in four different languages and we have developed over 200 briefs regarding kids uh, what we do is uh, we we develop our curriculums uh, based on build environment combined with different fields. Um, we have been running most of our classes after a pandemic uh, virtually. Um, we have been also doing other stuff which I'm going to skip as we're running out of time. So uh, why, why we are here, why, why we started this collaboration. I think in the, at the core of what we are doing is built environment. So whatever we have been doing has been involved around this idea of built environment. And of course, Pavilion is also focused on Urban SDG 11, which at the heart of it is built environment. Uh, these are some uh, works that we've been carrying out uh, the last six years, focusing on different aspects of uh, SDG 11. Um, so you can see, for instance, this is a green corner, uh, which kids work on to try to understand how plants work and to try to be inspired by it and learn from it in order to build their environment or enhance uh, the quality of their living. Uh, this is another one uh, influenced by a flood that happened a couple of years ago in, Ter in Iran. Uh, so we have been doing this for six years and we had this opportunity, great opportunity, thanks to Reza, um, to start thinking about bringing this experience and applying it to, uh, uh, to, to do this initiative program. So th these are some of the topics of SDG uh, goals that we've been touching through our workshops and courses. And as you can see, our, our, uh, our idea is to have this as an interwoven uh, form of uh, knowledge. Um, so at, uh, one of the key thing about what we do, and I think this is perhaps something that's gonna help us uh, with what we are doing uh, with World Urban Pavilion, uh, is we, we, we try to uh, train or uh, educate kids and make them cross disciplinary thinkers. And that's because of the magic of architecture. How architecture allows you to, I mean, we constantly work with different disciplines, and this is something inherited in, in our discipline. We are all coming from the back architecture background. Um, so these are some of the topics uh, and fields that we have been uh, working with, with artists, uh, 
have specialists in different fields. So we, we have focus on different things like Archie Math, Archie Art, uh, Archie Buddy, Archie Green. I'm not going to go to all of these. Uh, so the whole idea here is uh, we use this, uh, let's say, skill that we have obtained because of working in the field of architecture to collaborate with all sorts of artists, all sorts of um, scientists, people from different fields, and we believe that we can bring that idea and use it in, in the pavilion uh, and bring more people and make new network of people who are interested and uh, active in the field of kids. So uh, another important thing beyond, I and mean, this is for us, it's, uh, it's crucial, uh, the life skills that we try to transfer or to try to uh, teach kids, um, key things that are uh, been highlighted by UNICEF as well. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, I mean, working on teamwork, giving platform for kids to express themselves, um, these all prepare them to become these new future architects who are going to build our world and make it livable because the path that we're going, uh, it's not very promising. Um, uh, another key thing about what we have been doing, and again, we think this is something that we can bring on the table and we are hoping to create a, a platform where we can uh, uh, do more work uh, is the, this the idea of uh, having participatory uh, courses so kids uh, come and get involved. They even design their own toys. So as you can see here, uh, they have the chance to develop their own toys. We give them the space and technology where they can build their own blocks and then they build their own world using uh, these custom made uh, workshops. The, the, this concept uh, has been applied in, in a different uh, scale also. So we have been running uh, many, many uh, public events with participants ranging from 200 to uh, 1,000 a day. Um, here again, uh, it's, it's an accumulative uh, experience. Uh, people get together and start building and the community gets involved and engaged with what it's doing, and as you can see, uh, people from all range of, uh, with all sort of social backgrounds, social economical background, join us. Uh, this is an example, one, one example. Again, I'm just going to quickly show you, I'm not going to talk much about it, um, which shows how we get engaged with local community, how we bring all sorts of people from all different age groups together. Um, uh, in this particular case, we work with over 15 different activists and artists. Um, and this is the outcome of that 10-day festival, which was a great success. Uh, unfortunately, this was right before the pandemic, so uh, hopefully next year we're going to go back and continue with the experience. It was a collaboration with municipality of Tehran, and we had over 5,000 visitors. And again, it's is something that we are hoping to be able to do in, in, in the pavilion as well, uh, to connect ourselves uh, to the local community and get them engaged with what we are doing. Um, okay. No problem here, and um, yeah, this is this last part, this last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, so the idea here uh, is to use Regent Park uh, as as a base, and uh, we are thinking about to uh, uh, to start setting up some pop up stations uh, around the around the neighborhood uh, to get people of the community more engaged and uh, have different. Uh, weekly programs uh, run by, in collaboration between Kids and locals. Uh, so I think I, I, I leave it here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I see the...
Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Human Salibi. As I mentioned earlier, also, also as mentioned by uh, Shaveria, is the uh, Aki Kid consists of Human Salibi, Laila Sadri, and, uh, and the colleague Pantea Islami. Are they here? Can we just would like to come and just want to introduce all the three of you? Where is Pantea? Yeah, please come. Just. You know, uh, Archicade is one of the few organizations, setups, that already have done a sustainability profile. It's not easy that you have such a profile made by companies. We are asking for companies, private sector groups to make their profiles. Already, you are ahead of time in creating a sustainable profile thanks to Professor Yashebe. Because they believe that awareness is critical if you have to achieve lasting transformation. It's a two-way process, as you all know. It will also raise awareness of grown-ups. It's not only that we are raising awareness of kids, through that, raising our own awareness, which is, I think, a great example of intergenerational communication. And I'm glad that you've chosen World Urban Pavilion as one of your first step, whereas, as uh, Talebi mentioned, there'll be a number of activities throughout Toronto. There'll be pop-up, you know, uh, structures coming up to raise awareness of SDGs, their communities, what they can do and they cannot do. We also hope that we can establish partnership with UNICEF also in this context. We already in contact with them so that become uh, inter, inter, what shall I say, agency collaboration as well with academia behind us to talk about sustainability and practitioners and visionaries. Thank you once again for this. And I think you wanted to say a few words, Laila. Uh, I just want to really thank uh, Region Park community for hosting us uh, and uh, just say that it's a start. And uh, this is a start for Archikid. And Archikid is very proud to present at the very uh, first uh, public event at the pavilion uh, and we are looking for many many more uh, activities to offer to youth and children because we believe that uh, uh, with providing an environment that uh, encourage a healthy growth uh, so uh, we can listen to each other and we can hear voices and bring up opportunities Pavilion will support us, other agencies will support us, uh, mayors, uh, uh, I mean, prime minister, everybody will support us. And we want to do something together for kids. Thank you so much. Oh, you just walk around, enjoy yourself, and talk to each other. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. And Ibrahim is there to guide you. Please. <laughs>